Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Councillor Yvonne Williams. I'm the Chair of the Corporate Parenting Committee. And I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting, the theme of which is accommodation. Um, before we go into the actual meeting itself, um, I'd like to do a sort of round robin of introductions, if that's OK with everybody. Um, so I will start with um, my left and proceed around my, my uh, uh, screen. So shout up at the end if I've missed you off. Um, and when I get to you, if you can just say who you are and uh, who you're representing. So I shall start with uh, Connie, please. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Connie Spencer. I'm the youth mayor for Derby. So I'm here to represent the voices of young people. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hesegrave. Hello, I'm Councillor Paul Hesegrave, uh, Labour and Cooperative Councillor for Abbey Ward, uh, and I'm on the C CYP committee. Thank you. Councillor Pegg. Hello, I'm Councillor Adrian Pegg um, from Mackworth Ward. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Kaiser. Good afternoon, everybody. Andrew Kaiser. I'm Head of Specialist Services, uh, Derby City Council. Thank you. Councillor Lind. Hi, I'm Councillor Danielle Lind, I'm Councillor for Blakeries Ward, and I also chair the Children and Young People's Overview and Scrutiny Board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hussain. Councillor Fried Hussain for Arbreeton Ward. Thank you. Uh, Heather. Afternoon. Um, I'm Heather Peat, I'm the designated nurse for Children in Care, working for Derby and Derbyshire CCG. And it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Evans. I'm Commissioning Manager for Children in Care and Placement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuss. Hi, uh, it's Councillor Kurt Cuss and I'm a councillor for Alveston Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Stevens. I'm the Democratic Services Officer for this meeting. Uh, I'll introduce my two colleagues as well. I've got Alex Huff on technical side and Steve Mason, who's dealing with microphones and muting. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, Lorraine. Hi, I'm Lorraine Smith. I'm Commissioning Manager for Early LPAM Participation. So I'm here today um, in place of the Participation Officer for the Children in Care Council. Thank you. Thanks, Marlene. Oh. Hello, Marlene. Marlene. Are you there? Hello. Sorry. Hi, Marlene. Uh, hi. Marlene Upchurch. I'm chair of the Foster Carers Association. Uh, thanks, Marlene. Welcome. Um, Pervez? Hello, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Pavez Akhtar. I'm the Deputy Head of Service of Children's Quality Assurance and I'm also the Corporate Parenting Lead. Thank you. Uh, Priya? I'm Priya, I'm the Deputy Youth Mayor for Derby and I'm also here re representing young people. Thank you. Uh, Steve? Uh, hi, Steve Atkinson, Independent Chair of the Derby and Derbyshire Safeguarding Children Partnership. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McChrystal? Hello there, I've just joined, so I'm not where, I'm sure where you're at, uh, um, Councillor Williams. Just introductions. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Councillor Ross McChrystal, Chelsea Ward Councillor. Thank you. Um, Sue Ann? Afternoon, everybody. I'm Sue Ann Lim. I'm the Director of Early Help and Children's Social Care, Derby City Council. Thank you. And Andy. Afternoon, everybody. Andy Smith, Strategic Director for People. Have I managed to get everybody or have I been really bad and missed somebody off? Got everybody? I think you've got everybody, Councillor Williams. I think you managed to Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, as I said earlier, welcome everybody and uh, um, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate that. So we'll uh, go straight on and then into the, uh, the meeting and can we take apologies, please? Sure. You've had apologies from Judy Levitt, Joanna Barker and Pauline and Anderson. Thank you. Um, any late items to be introduced by the chair? 
um, I don't have any. Um, and the third item then is declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest from anybody on the meeting? I take silence as that golden rule. Um, then item four then is the uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of October 2020. And if you can just bear with me while I pull it up. Um, if I go through um, for matters of accuracy first, um, please shout up if you have any matters of accuracy. So um, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and the final page 14. Happy for me to sign those off then as an accurate and true record. Excellent. Again, um, if I can just go through the, the minutes then, if there are any matters arising that are not on the agenda, um, please shout up. Um, and again, if we go through those, uh, page one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, and the final page 14. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so back to the agenda then, items. And the next item then is the Children in, in Care Council update. Um, and I believe, Lorraine, you're going to take this for us. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you very much. Um, so just a very um, a short overview of the paper that was submitted. Um, since the last meeting, there have been three further virtual meetings with the Children in Care Council. They were hosted um, with the participation officer when he was in post and came back to do the December one for us. Um, so the first one back in October was looking at asking the young people and the members of the um, Children in Care Council to try to encourage more involvement um, from any anyone they think could be interested and to encourage ideas on um, uptake from the young person's point of view. Um, and it was also to say that our in-house children's homes are now able to facilitate um, young people joining the virtual meetings. So we hope to see more involvement from um, those residential homes over the, the coming months. In the November meeting, um, it was to look uh, it was explained around the children in care, um, the members, um, the age increase to the 24-year-olds, um, and that will probably look at two different meetings, the younger ones and then the older ones at a slightly later time on, on the agenda. Um, they also had the Change, Grow, Live adv advocacy service attend on that meeting just to discuss the roles and the opportunities that they present when they provide the um, independent visitors. Um, into um, to support the young people in foster families and residential care. It was a service that not many um, of the young people was aware of. Um, so we're going to do some publicity around um, around the council and um, wider in order for the young people to know more about that and um, use that independent um, support should they require. 
Um, and then in December 1, um, the participation um, announced that um, he was leaving the role um, and he'd successfully gained a position, a full-time position in residential care, which has been, for the majority of last year due to COVID, he's been redeployed into that role due to um, staffing issues um, around the COVID situation, um, which we're really, really pleased for him. It's um, uh, a really great, uh, a great thing uh, for him and I wish him all the success. So on the back of the participation officer leaving us, um, we did go out to advert um, in December. Um, the interviews um, took place on the 28th of January, involving a member from the Leaving Care team, um, a social worker who also um, helps and supports with the Children in Care Council, and a Children in Care member himself. Um, vital um, input um, there was from that young person. And we have um, appointed a, a young lady who currently works for Derbyshire County Council as a family resource worker. So we look forward to welcome, welcome, welcoming her um, as soon as all the final checks can be done and the DBS and everything else that we need to make sure is in place um, uh, for that role. Um, and then, um, like it says again, there's been very little um, to update from a care leaver's point of view. This will be a vital element to the role in order to support the care leaver's team um, and be able to look at um, increase the numbers in the Children in Care Council, various different ways of working with providers for the uptake and make sure the young, per young people's voices heard as much as we possibly can and help support the care leaver's team. Um, with their engagement and participation. Um, and I think that that's covers everything I wanted to say today. Without there's any questions, Councillor Williams, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, I think we would um, firstly echo your um, thanks to the previous participation officer and wish him all the best in his new role. Um, uh, you know, um, he's made some great changes in his, his time there um, and also look forward to welcoming the new participation um, officer. Um, I'm really, really glad that you said that during the, the recruitment we had a, a young person yes. uh, involved in that. I think that's really crucial. So I'm really pleased with that. Um, is, um, sorry, Councillor Williams, uh, is, um, is, is um, input in the interviews was absolutely fantastic. Um, and it was basically down to his th thoughts and feelings and the engagement that he had with the, the person in question that did ma make the final decision. So, yeah, it's lovely to have him there. Great, thank you. That's really good. Um, so I'd like to open up to the floor for any questions for Lorraine. Right. Silence again. Can I then, if there's uh, nobody wants to say it, thank you for bringing the report. But can I ask everybody, please, there were a couple of recommendations on the report at 2.1 and 2.2 um, to consider the, the content of the report and feedback from Children and Care Council and to consider ways to encourage new members to become involved in the Children and Care Council. Are you happy with those recommendations? Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Right. Um, so the next item then on the agenda thank is, thank you, Lorraine, is a Children's Placement Overview Report. And I will hand over to Katie. Hi. Thank you, Council Williams. Um, I just wanted to give an overview really to how we supply hope and support homes and support for our children and young people. So in commissioning, we work with our teams in children's social care and early help to find foster carers, children's homes and provision for young people who are 16 to 17 years old to live in sem semi independently with support. So the local authority has put in place the following. So we liaise with our internal fostering and internal children's homes first to see if there's any placements there. And then we work with frameworks that we've put in place. So this is a selection of um, providers that have applied and gone through numerous checks to ensure they're delivering safe and secure and supportive environments for our children and young people. So for foster carers and for um, children's homes placements, we go through our 
D2N2 Children in Care Framework and D2N2 stands for Derby, Derbyshire, Nottingham, Nottinghamshire so we're in partnership with them. Um, for our semi-independent, sometimes referred to as supported accommodation, we use a dynamic purchasing system. So this is where we've undertaken a number of checks of providers that are on our framework and are there ready with accommodation when we need it. We also tap into a DPS, a dynamic purchasing system, which is a high needs one. So more complex needs for our 16, 17 year olds in supported accommodation, which Nottinghamshire have put in place. So we very much work in partnership with our other local authorities. So as a local authority, we continue to see an overall increase in the total numbers of children in care. Um, this is also detailed um, more in the sufficiency strategy, which is attached to Appendix 1. But just to give you an overview of some of the numbers. So in, on the 31st of March 2019, we had 568 children in care. That continued to rise uh, to 588 at the 31st of March 2020. And as of the 31st of December, we've got 640 children in care. So as you can see, we're seeing that continued increase in numbers. Just to break that down into some of the areas to give you a little bit of an idea, we're seeing a 12% increase in external foster placements over that period. We're also seeing a 31% increase in children's homes. And um, on the counterbalance of that, we're actually seeing a reduction of 2.7% in our semi-independent. And this is mainly a result of our unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. Um, we had an increase in previous years um, of those presenting within Derby and us finding suitable um, support and homes for them. And this year, we've seen a decrease in that. Um, and that's partly due to how... Um, when they come into the country, they're being processed and they're being age assessed um, and also potentially an impact of COVID as well. We're seeing that. So um, a decrease in that area. In terms of making sure these places are suitable for our children and young people, we undertake uh, quality assurance. We work closely with our social care colleagues within the local authority and also providers in building that relationship. So for our foster and residential placements, these are regulated under Ofsted. Um, and we always look to place within a good or an outstanding Ofsted um, registered provider. And also, however, for our 16 to 17 supported accommodation, this is an area that is unregulated. So this is a large focus of our quality assurance work. We do a quality assurance process and we also have a stand statement that we stand by behind that. Um, so we make sure we're checking quality at application stage of the provider, at the award stage, at the matching stage, and then ongoing while that child or young person is matched with that provider. And they are done through actual visits to the provider and also virtual and desktop quality assurance. In addition to this, we also share information about providers within our D2N2 sort of collaborative commissioning approach to make sure we are highlighting concerns as early as possible, whether they come through children and young people, whether they come through our social care colleagues or other professionals as well. So just moving on as well to touch a bit on sufficiency, so making sure we have the right placements in the right location. So we're really trying to focus, and especially this year, on providing more local provision for our children and young people. So the sufficiency strategy was written in 2019, but we did refresh it at the end of 2020 um, to have some of the latest figures in there. And the aims of having that is to make sure that we're listening to the voice of the children and young people to shape our services. And um, that's not just at the start, but ongoing so that it can adapt and change. Um, we're, as I said, really focusing on this, trying to get more local provision, a wider offer to meet the needs of our children and young people. So closer to Derby, where is that suitable with the support services around it? We're also trying to really focus on outcome focused models, seeing the distance travelled, really hitting those outcome targets for our children and young people making a difference. Reducing high cost placements, so best value of money for our public funds as well, as we're working with a number of external providers. And as I say, continually renewing 
our offer to make sure that it's meeting need as well. As I say, some of the challenges that we really face are the continuing increase in number of children coming into care and the difficulty, therefore, in securing placements. This is an, a national issue, especially around foster care placements, where there aren't the numbers or the specific type of foster care for those more complex um, needs and challenging behaviours. So we work very closely with our provider forums for our foster carers to try and understand how we can make it easier for them to to, from right through from referrals to matching to that the support is in place for them. We're also focusing, as I say, on where our children and young people are placed distance from Derby as a result of the right match not being available at the right time and encouraging the market and our providers to either change their focus of delivery to what we need more or increase the provision within Derby or securing provision that might currently be um, a placement from an other, other authority place there. So we're working really closely with providers, we put out market position statements, we hold provider forums um, to ensure they are know what our need is um, now and going forward in the future. Um, and so in terms of what are we else are we doing to make sure? So as I say, we've got our D2N2 approach. So we're making sure we work across a, a smallish footprint, but we're making sure within that footprint, we're working with providers to increase the provision and the number of children placed locally. Um, we're making sure there's more choice there for our children and young people, um, especially when it comes to more sort of semi-independent. We need to make sure that the quality is there, but also the choice for them as well. But also when I touch on making sure we're concentrating on achieving outcomes, um, we've recently started a social impact bond program called STARS and this is where we are working with a private investor and some government funding to deliver an outcomes model. It's a two years of support for a child and young person and their carers around them and it's specifically aimed at stepping across from residential to foster care so where a place might have escalated and ended up in um, residential care but they're suited to foster care then we're stepping them across back into foster care we're also providing support around foster care stability um, we're also helping reunification with family and also early help as well in that program and then as I say real key is working really closely with our providers to make sure the provision is there at the point of need for our children and young people and we have first dibs on our placements within Derby so that's what we're really working on at the moment this year. Um, at the same time we're really conscious that we want to ensure that the voice of the child is there so we encourage and use the forums that our providers um, put in place with our children, young people and feedback. We also, on the quality assurance process, ensure that we are talking to and capturing the voice of the young person about their accommodation and their support packages. We always take on board feedback and, as I say, really moving towards some of those outcome models and using the STARS outcome programme to make sure that feeds into our future services. So that's a brief overview of placements and I just want to open it up if anybody's got any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Uh, very con po comprehensive report there and the uh, strategy attached as well at the appendix, um, which gives much more detail. Um, I know I'm, I'm quite assured by um, what the report and the strategy says, particularly with equality, but I'm also um, grateful now that we, we're looking towards that more outcomes focused and the STARS programme I think is is quite exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the benefits and the outcomes of those. Um, so very glad we're, we're doing that. Um, just before I open up to the floor as well, just to let you know that um, as well as all the work that's been going on there, um, directors of children's services so um, from Darby Andy and lead members across D2N2 um, have actually been meeting and working together to try and have a look to see if there are things that we can do as well as the current ongoing work with D2N2 um, in terms of um, fostering and placements and actually um, working together 
um, yeah. which um, it's not rocket science, um, but we um, we're trying to break down those barriers and those sort of um, that, that's my placement sort of issues that, that might have been there in the past to try and work together and um, to see what we can do. Um, I'd like to open up now for any questions for Katie or any items you'd like um, more understanding on. Chair? Yes. Yeah, th thank you very much, Katie, for a very uh, thorough report. Um, you know, it's, it's sad that the numbers of people coming into care is rising, but it's reassuring that they're actually finding somewhere where they're going to be supported by professionals with, you know, really good policies and uh, an eye to the future and lots of experience in the field. Um, I, j I don't know if this was touched on at the last meeting, which I couldn't make, uh, and it's a it's concerning placements in the sense that there was a discussion about um, the number of residents from our children's homes who go missing or the frequency of events, uh, and there was a, re a recommendation that things were looked at in terms of um, trying to prevent that. Now, clearly, it's a different context from normal because so many young people are out and about all the time. You know, many of their peers are more available rather than being in school. And there might be a temptation and all that kind of thing. So I do understand that as a kind of background. And I just wonder if um, there has been um, any, uh, any kind of progress in um, managing missing occasions of, of, of our young people being missing from our care homes. Oh, the other thing as well I wanted to say before I ask that question is it's great that more and more of our young people are being looked after locally if that's safe to do so. You know, some need to be placed a long way away from home, don't they, because of possibility of contact with people they shouldn't come in contact with. But it's great to know that they're, they're getting they're getting placed more um, more likely to be placed in a local in a local uh, area. Yeah. So just a question about missing residents. OK, thank you. If I can um, bring Andrew in, if you're able to answer that, Andrew, in terms of an update. I can chair, yes. Um, yeah, Paul's response, we, we have kind of uh, actioned a number of the recommendations in the last uh, board poll. Uh, one of the things was the return interview format being rationalised and more streamlined, which Kelly Ormond, who's our strategic lead for missing children, has done in collaboration with uh, colleagues across police and residential children's homes. So that's recently been put into place. Uh, we've also looked at training um, for what's called non-violent resistance for residential home staff. Ah, and that's part of a longer term plan, Paul, for those residential staff. What we've done is preface that training with some concordat and some trauma-informed training for those staff. And then NVR will come uh, later on. So there, there is a kind of planned training program for those residential staff. And that's part of the whole contextual safeguarding missing Concord Act partnership work that we're undertaking with partners across all of the homes in the city. Uh, we've also delivered Concord Act training for new staff coming in at Rosewood and that was delivered in December and it was a partnership event that was led by residential homes, the youth offending service with some input from the police and health as well. And we've also got the homes linked in with the new police missing persons team. So in the south um, of the city, uh, the police missing persons team um, are linked in with the homes. They're attending uh, Concordat tactical meetings. So Laura, the lead for that team, is linked in with Chris and Sharon leading on the homes. And there are single points of contact in the police for each of the homes in the city and the county, actually. And that goes for not just our own homes, but also the private uh, sector as well. So there is a really good partnership with the police around that kind of aspect. And we're getting really good information from police tasking meetings and intelligence on hotspots, risk issues, other young people that ours might be linked in with. So whilst there is a high number and there's always been a high volume of kind of missing episodes from children in our care homes, what it does show is good compliance for the missing protocol, missing from home and care protocol. And really concern would be raised if there was kind of lack of reporting of children going missing. Right. I think I think the strength and the reassurance you might need as board members is that there is partnership work on um, with the police and with key partners around contextual safeguarding, including missing uh, youth crime, those kind of features where young people are missing and they're placing themselves or others at risk. 
we have got kind of good partnerships in place to make sure that we can respond to that. It, it is an ongoing challenge and I think it always will be. Um, but the work that we've put in place so far is managing that as as well as we can really. And I think another aspect was around a brochure for the homes that Sharon was developing, Sharon Green. And we've developed some of this through the Concordat work that we're doing as well. So partners have supplied information on what they're doing to make the offer within our residential children's homes as good as it can be uh, for our children in the city. And we've been chasing that up with partners. And I think most of that information is back now to produce and provide the brochure on what children can expect in our care, including links with the teams like the missing persons team within the police, etc. So I think that covers broadly most of the kind of recommendations last time around, Paul. Well, oh, thanks very much. Um, and I hope I didn't re you had to re-rehearse something that was at the last meeting. But I do think, Chair, uh, that we ought to have a recommendation that the board were reassured that uh, partnership work uh, in relation to children, young people going missing from uh, our homes um, was uh, being, um, had been, um, shall we say, um, it was verified that this work is, is uh, extensive and well coordinated, something like that. But I think it's worth noting that in the report. Sure, no problem, Paul. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, was there any other questions for Katie on that then, please? Thank you, Andrew. No yeah, if I, if I could, uh, Chair, it's Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Come on in. Uh, a couple of things. Obviously, a lot of very good work going on, which which is is bearing fruit. But obviously, I think there's, there's a lot more positive to come in. So, so I applaud that and I'm assured by it. Uh, I just wanted to question in terms of placement sufficiency and, and cost, which I know is, is dear to your heart. Uh, what action is being taken by the authority, perhaps in uh, partnership with uh, uh, working together with, with others in D2N2? Uh, to put pressure on, on government to try and uh, influence placement sufficiency, particularly uh, in terms of, of cost. I'll let you go first, Katie, <laughs> and then I'll come in. Thanks. Yeah, um, as I say, we work as a D2N2, but we also work regionally and we feed regularly back in um, to the task groups and task force around this. As I say, it is a national problem that sufficiency isn't enough. Um, and at the moment, it's very reliant on each local authority to work with their in-house and providers to provide enough but we work with the foster carers a national association of foster carers i presented to them the other week and just understanding that they're dealing with you know over 200 referrals for one placement a day um, and issues like that and it forcing up the cost in terms of market value so we regularly compare and report back on our costs and compare them regionally and nationally um, to ensure um, at I understand at strategic director level from a D to N2 that is fed back in as well um, so yeah it is being fed back in through different avenues um, but yeah it's it's trying to find resourceful ways in the same time as um, making the government clear that there is a real need for more foster provision um, within the whole country. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. I, I pre appreciate you working hard on this and, and you're working with one arm behind your back, of course, which makes it even more difficult. Thank you. And Steve, just to give you those uh, assurances, I know we've spoken earlier, um, but um, as I said, we are um, both the directors and the lead members working um, with D2N2, but also um, on um, we have a, an East Midlands regional um, lead members and directors meeting um, where we do have um, access into ministers and we are indeed um, lobbying our ministers through that route as well, um, which is something that, that all of the lead members, and that's cross-party, um, uh, have been doing. And um, to some success, we have got access into the, the ministers. I think I've got a meeting next week with the East Midlands regional members. Um, and personally, um, my uh, my letter writing has never been so sharp, shall we say? Um, and I will continue to do that um, to see if we can get some um, movement into the understanding of government and what the issues are. 
um, and I'm happy to accept any advice in terms of where you think we could go to. We work through the LGA as well in terms of getting um, them because they've got a very strong voice with the minister. So we, we try and uh, lobby our friends in the LGA as well to try and get them to uh, to pass that message on. Um, Andy, is there anything that we've missed there in terms of um, answering Steve's question? The, the only thing to add, um, Yvonne, is that the DfE have now launched the long-awaited um, care review, which has come out as a review of children's social care, but will include, um, as part of it, um, a fairly fundamental root and branch review uh, around the whole provider market because of the issues that really Katie and Steve and yourself have outlined in terms of the increased demand, pressure, cost, sufficiency, all the things that we've talked about for many, many years, it feels, in, in this committee and in scrutiny and at Cabinet, um, but probably have worsened in the past 11 months due to the impact of COVID uh, in terms of um, both an increase in the number of children coming into care, as Katie said, and children staying in care longer because of things like the courts being paused and that's delayed us being able to move children into permanent, although actually we've done very well in the last, um, in quarter three in terms of adoption numbers locally compared to say other councils in the East Midlands. Um, so what we're anticipating in the next um, couple of months, the chair is going to start at the beginning of March. Um, there will be a meeting in the East Midlands with DCS, the Director of Children's Services, to try and see if we can help shape and scope the terms of reference because it's quite a broad review and we need there to be a very clear roadmap um, signifying exactly how and what's going to be covered and clearly a key priority for us is going to be around the, um, the whole um, placement sufficiency issue for kids in care because it's, it's a really challenging position. Thanks. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, so, um, any more questions there for, for Katie on that? So if we have a look at the recommendation, there's the one recommendation in the report, but could we also, um, Lindsay, add on the recommendation from uh, Councillor Hesselgrave, please, in terms of um, the, uh, the board being assured um, about the missing work being carried out? Yep, sure, will do. Lovely, thank you. Is everybody happy with those two recommendations? Excellent, yeah. thank you. Uh, bear with me while I just pull up my paperwork again. Um, right, thank you very much for the, those reports, Katie, but I believe we're back to you again yeah. for the next item on the agenda. So, uh, update, report on emotional health and wellbeing services for looked after yeah. children. Back over to you, Katie. Thank you, Council Williams. Um, this report is to highlight the support um, Derby City Council is offering to our children and young people in care, their carers and also the professionals around the child or young person. Um, it's to ensure they have a safe place to talk to people who can offer different types of support, conversations, groups and therapies. So it's an update really as since September 2020, um, Derby City Council has worked alongside Action for Children to embed a new service. So Action for Children was successfully in tendering for this service. They have an excellent track record and experience in ensuring young people and their carers are supported and outcomes are achieved. Um, so they've been successful in delivering programmes such as Futures in Mind as well. So the new service offer is an expanded offer. So it's not just for Derby, it crosses boundaries. So we're working alongside Derbyshire, but also within 25 miles of Derbyshire. So it's reaching more of our children and young people. Um, it's also an increase in the provision offered. It's also an increase in the staff delivering, both from Leopold Street, where it was previously delivered, and also outreach locations, depending on need as well. So really listening to our children, young people and carers. So the staff from the previous service, which was called The Keep, some of you might recognise that, um, have been transferred over to the new service, and there's been an additional six posts um, created. So this is a joint funded program between Derby City Council and Derby and Derbyshire NHS Clinical Commissioning Group, otherwise known as the CCG. Um, so the service is currently and will reach more of our children and young people and their carers. And it's to deliver the following services. So therapeutic work, um, including um, 
TheraPlay, for example, attachment um, therapy, but also including a new area, which is called a WRAP service, which is Wellness Recovery Action Planning um, Supporting Placements. So it's supporting those placements that are moving back to Derby and the surrounding areas specifically. So as I was saying before, focus of where it's suitable, bringing our placements back towards our local area or placing within our local area because we can really add those wraparound support programs such as this one to it as well. As I say, as a continued focus on um, trauma-informed services as well as increasing sort of group work and targeted group work, uh, continuation and increase availability around consultations with a clinical psychologist or a lead therap therapist. Also, reflective practices in there as well, with a, which can be regular and dedicated specifically, and also picking up and increasing on the training um, that will be available for our carers and for professionals as well. So anything from trauma and fraud to attachment, but a real flexible program that can meet the needs and our carers and professionals can feed into that training program as well. So the new service is um, not only working on caseloads that they carried forward from the old service, so there was a continuation in service, but also has picked up new referrals and is continuing to pick up new referrals daily. So the service has been communicated to social care teams and wider professionals, and we will continue to do more communications on that, and the take-up is starting to be really positive. We also have regular meetings, not just contracts, but regular meetings between the local authorities, social care colleagues and action to children. And this is to really ensure that Derby children and carers are getting what they need um, and we can prioritise the service and adapt the service as we go along to meet their needs. Um, we're still seeing the largest proportion of referrals are for young people either between the ages of 5 and 10 or 11 and 15 years old. So still sort of up to sort of teenage years and consultation is still the largest area of work for Action for Children. But that is followed up by therapeutic work as well. So during the tendering and the mobilisation of this new service, um, as I say, we were bringing together funding from both ourselves and the CCG. Um, an interim offer was put in place um, through the CCG, and then this interim offer was embedded in what's called a community triage offer, which is still available um, through the CCG. And this ensured that there was service available there for children and young people and their carers and professionals if needed. So this included um, therapeutic support and consultations, so therapy such as TheraPlay. Where there wasn't a service that was specifically available, then we were able to spot purchase those services if asked for it. Um, we have, however, seen that a number of referrals wanted to be transferred to the new service and new referrals um, were willing to wait until the service had mobilised. Um, but what we're really keen now is that that continues to pick up with the referrals and as we come through COVID and we see the impact of that, then there's a fully mobilised offer there ready to pick up and support the needs of our children, young people, carers and our professionals that wrap around that child and young person as well. The um, good thing about the development and mobilisation alongside the um, community triage offer is it now sits alongside that CCG offer and it also allows if there are ineligible referrals which sometimes happens into the service, it isn't just a no, we have a direct route on something else and also we have a referral out of the service as well. So when the service has done and achieved its outcomes, uh, but there's still other options that need to be explored, there's other routes out for the referral. So there's that real joined up approach there as well. Um, foster care has been continued to be supported through the um, Derby City Council Foster Care Helpline and their supervising social workers. And I just, I suppose we want to really highlight how Action for Children have been um, really proactive in this contract. Um, throughout COVID-19, they have continued to deliver face-to-face -face therapy where they need to and with the appropriate risk assessments. Um, 
They have moved the majority of consultations um, to virtual consultations using technology such as this, um, as well as reflective practice. Um, I suppose what we're seeing is the impact of COVID-19 is more around on those sort of training um, and where they can do some more reflective practice sort of in our in-house residential and that offer around that. So Action for Children are as keen as we are to roll that out as soon as possible and ensuring that it's safe and within the restrictions. Um, we've engaged with um, ensuring through the tender process that we've got um, children and young people's voices, but we're really keen to continue to ensure that this is gathered as we go along and it helps shape and adapt the service as we go. So that will continue to be gathered and reported on and fed into the service. And one thing that we're doing at the moment is it's, I think we all feel that emotional health and wellbeing service is quite a clunky title. So at the moment, children and young people are being asked um, to select a new name for the service. So they've come up with a number of suggestions and we're just shortlisting those at the moment um, so that they're fully engaged in that process as well. So, as I say, exciting times, a new service, an expanded offer, and it's just about continuing those communications. So, um, carers, uh, social care, social workers, professionals all know how, and they can refer into the programme and what's available for them. So, if anybody's got any questions. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, <clears throat> from, from my point of view, um, really pleased with... Um, a smooth transition in the COVID uh, setting as well. Um, so uh, pleased with that. Really pleased about the expansion of the services and also the training um, for carers um, and staff on that. Um, I've had the um, assurances um, about the referrals, not just um, in, but the referrals out and, and to other services should there not be a uh, access onto the programme um, and I think that's something that's quite often missed um, in some services so that's really good to hear um, and I think my final point there was um, you just mentioned uh, about the voice of the child and I wanted to make sure that um, as we went on um, the children young people's um, voice is definitely heard but they're um, involved in terms of making sure that the um, the services provided are what they are wanting and needing as well um, as what the professionals might be saying is wanted and needed. So I think that's a really important point to keep the focus on that. Um, but overall, um, personally, I'd like to say thank you to, to you, but also to, uh, to Action for Children um, in very difficult circumstances in, in getting the transition done and to um, getting that expansion of service I think it's, it's a really good move for our children um, so if you could pass on that thanks from me as a chair I'd really appreciate that happy to open up to um, questions now for Katie from anybody else just uh, uh, chair if I may um, sure. the uh, you talk about um, some measurable outcomes for Action for Children. Obviously, it's at the start, but will we be uh, given some figures and some evidence um, at a later date on that? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, we're having at least quarterly monitoring. Um, it will start with monthly to begin with and quarterly. So they supply us with a dashboard, which is scrutinised, and I'm more than happy to share that. Smashes. And we'll make sure it comes to a future meeting, Paul. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, and um, I'd just uh, I'd like to echo what Yvonne said about uh, involving the young people in uh, maybe getting a different title for the rather clunky one, which is there at the moment, and not particularly uh, attractive maybe to young people, because they may feel they've been labelled straight away. Yeah. Um, so it's great, and I think it might be worth us no noting that in some way, as well as noting the whole report, but notice the, the impact that uh, listening to young people is having on uh, how the service is delivered and perceived. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Steve, you're you're flashing at me. Did you want to speak? You're on mute. Sorry, Steve.
the, the council's already asked the question I was going to ask about reporting back on performance levels. So thank you. Great. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and any other um, questions or observations from the floor? No. Um, so the the recommendation there in the report. Are you happy to accept that? Yeah, happy. Great. Thank you very much. And again, thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks for all your time. Thank you very much. Uh, right. The uh, next item on the agenda then, item eight, Children's Performance Team Quarter 3 Update Report. Um, Andrew, I believe you're going to deliver this for us. Okay. It's yeah, it's a report on the child permanence team outcomes across quarter three. And for those of you that aren't aware, the child permanence team is a team made up of social workers and child practitioners um, to, uh, tasked with exiting young people from long term care, either through adoption or through exits back to family or kinship carers. So we were set a target um, for this year and next year um, for the number of exits and the number of adoptions over the year <clears throat> and those targets were for 24 young people to exit care um, in 2021 through the exit route which could be through to family members or kinship carers or even special guardians who are foster carers and then um, 28 uh, by re reunification uh, for next year. Uh, targets for adoption um, for 30 for 2021 and 35 for 21 22. So these are targets that have been set as part of the demand management agenda, um, looking at helping to manage the number of children coming into care, given those discussions that we've already had today around that black number. Um, furthermore, just as an update, we've also had three new staff that add, were added to the teams at the back end of last year through an invest to save approach. So we've had one new social worker starting the adoption part of the child permits team, one in the exit side of the team, and a children's practitioner who's going to be dealing with special guardianship support. So where children are supported um, up to 18 by special guardians and they are no longer looked after children, and that can be with a foster carer or a family member, they can come back to the local authority where things are becoming more challenging to ask for support. And the child practitioner's work in this role would be to make sure that that support is assessed and they're directed onto the right path for support, utilising local authority resources, universal provision, or even access to what's called the Adoption Support Fund, where there are kind of monies available to special guardians as well as adopters for therapeutic interventions. So this report mainly deals with looking at whether or how we bet or fared against the targets that have been set for us in the child permanence team. Um, so in quarter three, um, five children exited care through the exit route, and two of those children were via special guardianship orders, which is a court made, uh, order made at court. One child was placed with a parent, and two returned to extended family members. Uh, we've got another nine potential special guardianship applications in the court process, and as has already been mentioned in today's meeting, the process through court is slower than usual given COVID and the backlog that was already in courts nationally pre-COVID due to the increase in care proceedings for children and young people. But we are confident that those nine SGOs um, could be made uh, moving into quarter four. Um, we're also optimistic of eight young people then um, exiting care through special guardianship orders by the end of this financial year and another nine we've got in transit through assessments um, into 21-22. So that work is ongoing. The child permits team are working with the children in care teams with IROs and acute quality assurance service to identify those cases that could be moved on safely back into uh, family homes or into special guardianship arrangements. I'm also working with two families and we're thinking that our permits can be achieved through the making of child arrangement orders by the end of the financial year. And we're also assessing three placement with parents at the moment and I've got a couple of those in my inbox ready to be approved, subject to me looking over those. So all in all, we're estimating between 16 and 18 exits through the exit from care side of the child permits team in financial year 2021 which is slightly disappointed because it doesn't quite hit the target that we were set 
Um, although COVID has slowed that down somewhat and the additional staff didn't start in the team until December 2020. There is better news in regards to adoption, which Andy's already touched on. Um, across quarter three, standing alone, we've had 14 best interest decisions with 33 decisions made to date. Of those 14 made in quarter three, uh, one had a placement order made. However, there were eight other placement orders made in that quarter for children that had had best interest decisions before that quarter. We're actively home finding for 11 children in quarter three and have identified placements for five of those. And we've moved 14 children to adoptive placements. So if we aggregate up um, placements for children going through adoption, we've placed 43 children to date in 2021, which is higher than last year. And it's higher than a number of years we've had since 2015-16. So we project, um, based on the figures that we've got, the cases that have been referred to the team out of the 12 placements before the end of the financial year in quarter four. So that would make a total of 55 children placed in financial year 2021. Um, we've had 12 adoption orders made in quarter three and 21 adoption orders made this financial year. Um, so we're on target, well, we're over target for the adoption side uh, of our targets um, through the demand management work. Uh, and of the 43 placements this year, 14 were to existing foster carers, seven had small adoption allowances agreed, and that was due to complex needs. So in, in a nutshell, the, the permanent team have grown in size, um, new processes have been developed for, by the child practitioner in relation to special guardianship support, the adoption side of things has grown exponentially and we've had real success in terms of, of having children exit care through adoption, which also meets their permanency needs. And we think we can do better and pick up the game in relation to exits back to uh, families through reunification or to carers or extended family through special guardianships or child arrangements orders next year with new staff in place. So that's just an overview of the performance in quarter three and some of the aggregated data to date. The other thing to say is that the team manager recently was successful in applying for another job as a deputy head of service in another part of the city council and they've since moved on. So the team has a new team manager who will take a little bit of time, no doubt, to kind of bed in. But we're hoping that there's good continuity. There has been a really good handover between those managers to make sure that they understand all the processes that we've been putting in place. And so um, any kind of impact on performance should only be short lived. So uh, overall, um, I can hand back to the chair to see if there's any questions or thoughts from the committee. Thank you, Andrew. Um, a, a couple of thoughts from me. Um, first of all, really pleased with the um, additional support being put in for the um, SGO support there. Really good to hear that. And the adoptions figures are, I'm just really really pleased with those I think year on year we've been making some amazing um, changes there um, particularly for the permanency outcomes for those um, children um, I suppose the question that I'd like to ask you mentioned the issues around the courts and the backlog prior to COVID but then also due to a, a number of um, issues through COVID in the courts um, I know that um, Sue Ann and Andy and yourself will have been working. Are you able to give us a little bit more information or Sue Ann able to step in and give us information about how the courts um, are going to um, help us with, with this backlog and if there is anything that, that we can do as a, um, a committee to assist in that? Yep, I can come in there, um, Chair. Thanks, Sue Ann. Um, the, the courts, the... The capacity is actually increasing in the courts at the present time. They are making good headway in terms of um, the backlog that they have had. Um, we know that the the time scale has, is 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 about ten weeks on each of those on each of those cases that are going through. Um, there has been additional judiciary um, that have been secured for Derby and Derbyshire, which will be helpful, and the courts are actively. Um, implementing what's called a hi hybrid court. So um, it doesn't mean that everybody has to be present for hearings to take place. Um, and so that our, our sitting judge um, 
Judge Willis Croft is very discerning, uh, very committed to ensuring that the pace is picked up. Um, and I think given the outcomes that we have seen in quarter three, that is an indication of some of that pace being built up. And we've got, um, again, um, a good a good number that are going to be progressed during quarter four as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think I think the, 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 the pace has been built up. The courts are absolutely um, committed to to progressing as many children as they possibly can in a safe way. OK, thank you, Swan. That's that's reassuring to know. And I, I'm glad the, the courts are making those changes. Uh, and obviously, from a, a committee point of view, we're, we'll keep an eye on that and maybe have an, another uh, look at that further on um, in the uh, in the year. If we can have a look to see how if the impact has has worked, as we hope it would do. I'm happy to open up to a um, question from the floor for Andrew. Any questions for Andrew on that? No. Um, can I say thank you very much, Andrew, and please pass on our thanks to the uh, the teams for us. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back to the agenda. Please bear with me. I'm not very good at this IT switching between screens yet. I'll get there and they'll uh, be going back to normal meetings. Um, right. The next item then is item nine: inspection and monitoring of children's homes. Um, Sharon. If Sharon's not here yet, I know that she okay. um, doubles up as a magistrate during the um, during her work, so I can take this report. If you wouldn't mind, Sue, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. And kudos to Sharon for doubling up. If I start my video. Sue Ann, do you want me to do the presentation? Yeah, I wasn't sure. But we haven't been having presentations today, have we? So um, I wasn't quite sure if people were using them. But yes, we can put that. I've got a small presentation that Sharon had prepared. Thank you. OK, so the report covers um, the last period of, of um, the activity within the children's home since the last meeting. Um, and just as a as a recap, in terms of inspection and monitoring of children's homes, um, there are a number of ways in which our children's homes are are scrutinized um, and they're outlined in in that in the, on the first page. So we have a, a mixture of formal inspection by Ofsted. Um, we have our internal uh, independent visitor called a Regulation 44 that um, visits that um, um, inspect our homes, and then we have a program of our elected members. Now, given COVID over the last 12 months, um, some of these have have been affected. So, in terms of in Ofsted, Ofsted have suspended all formal inspections over this last year. And I'll go into a little bit more about what they have done because they they haven't they have actually been um, keeping a close grip on on the quality um, and the functioning of the homes. The regulation 44 visits um, have been continuing because there are are our internal um, independent monthly visits. Um, they have been done. Um, is a mixture of virtual contact with the homes and when we came out of lockdown some of those have been carried out um, via physical visits. In terms of elected members, um, a, number of, a number of elected members were trained um, and identified to start those visits at the at the end of um, 2019 um, were due to go out, but unfortunately COVID has meant that they have not been able to undertake that. But they are absolutely ready and waiting for when COVID lifts. Um, in terms of what Ofsted have been doing, instead they have been undertaking what's called assurance visits. Um, and that means that they have been doing um, virtual contact with with our homes, um, and they have actually come out and 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 been out to a couple a couple of them. Um, so we've had two assurance visits um, that happened in September, and the detail of those are in the 
are in the table on um, page three of the of the report. Um, we, if people can remember, we um, had two homes that were closed at the end of 2019. Um, one of those has reopened um, in September and fully functional. Um, and we, a new team has been has been um, recruited, and they're all in place. Uh, the second home, if we move to the, the next slide, Linz. Sure. Um, okay, so the second home is is due to open um, imminently um, in in April in April May, and again we've recruited a, a new a new staff group to um, to to cover those those um, cover the, that that home. Um, we also have been doing. A, um, we've also had a, a quite an ambitious tra um, development program over this year, despite COVID, um, and we know that our strategy has been around ensuring that um, there is as much individual support to our children and young people as possible. And we know that the smaller the home. Um, is better to meet the rising complexity of needs um, that our, our looked after children present. We also know that um, that young people at the age of 18 often struggle uh, when they move into adulthood and in into independence. So part of this last year, we have been um, developing a portfolio of what's called transition properties, and we've secured four of those working alongside Derby Homes and our strategic housing. And they are aimed at those children, young people um, aged 16 to 18. Um, and they essentially will be managed by our internal residential staff, but they are essentially to ensure that independent skills are are developed and that you, our children, young people are supported in a much more holistic and robust way so that when they do reach 18, they are in a much, much better position. Um, we have those transition properties now um, and we are working on identifying young people who will who will be able to um, um, live in those particular those properties. Um, as I've just mentioned, we, we know that from research, we know that from our cohort of young people, that, that children's needs um, are very complex. And we know that um, the smaller the properties, the better ability we have to meet those needs. Um, so part of the development that has been part of the overall children's services strategy um, has again been to identify um, smaller properties in addition to our into our range of children's homes that are one or two bedded um, properties, and these will be um, aimed at those children who are under 16. Um, so we have um, identified two cluster properties um, and they're currently going through approval and due to be approved through cabinet in March and we will be then in a position again through our own residential children services staff be able to support children um, on an individual basis or or, in, or, or just with two um, we've had we have to be very clear and very robust around the matching of the children within our homes and if people are aware then the, currently the homes, whilst a lot smaller than they used to be five, ten years ago, um, sometimes a home of four or five beds can still be too large for the to meet the individual needs of those children. So we are absolutely confident that this is the way to go. We know that other authorities have gone down this route. Um, and we're very excited about about what this what this could mean for us. In addition to and supporting and supplementing the sufficiency strategy and the placements um, challenges that we've heard about earlier on um, in this board. In addition to that, we have been um, uh, recruiting host family schemes, and this is very akin to. Um, 
uh, befriending scheme um, is not where a young person would reside overnight, but this is around um, a befriending family scheme um, that would support a young person throughout their period um, in care. Um, this is still at early days. We've done some initial recruitment and have and have um, quite a bit of interest from um, concerned and um, interested families within Derby who, who are wanting to support and help our looked after children. So that again is a very exciting scheme. And the final piece of development is looking at, again, the transition element um, of our looked after children. And some, some children, uh, when they reach the age of 18, 17, 18, are not ready for full independence. Um, so our shared lives program is, is, an adult, is an adult program, very similar to uh, foster care but for for those young adults um, and we are um, developing that program so that there is smooth transition for those children who require a more family or um, family environment at the age of 18 to move into there okay next slide please okay i think i've mentioned um that the 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 one home that is uh, remains closest is is due to reopen, um, and we're confident that that will reopen in April and May time. Um, we have recruited a manager, um, and again a team to to reopen that. So we're confident about that. And the we have been we have been um, very creative with our recruitment of staff during this period. Um, we have been working again across the council with our adult learning services to look at recruitment and additionality um, for for training ex, um, um, for those for those potential staff members who are wanting to come into our service. And again, we have a very good induction, a good training package um, to aid retention. Um, but the recruitment side is an ongoing an ongoing challenge, and Sharon would be reiterating that um, if she was here. Um, but we are we are showing some green shoots in terms of of our of our recruitment strategy. Um, okay. I think that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sue Ann. Um, it, it is really interesting um, over the timescales that I've been involved with um, children's services to actually see the changes that have happened with it within our children's homes. Um, I do remember the very large sort of 16 bedded homes mm. and um, now looking from those larger homes to our smaller homes and now again the a transition to the the, the, the cluster homes um, and it it is good to see that we're constantly horizon scanning and talking with other um, authorities to find out what has worked um, and to make sure that we we um, continually do that so I'm really pleased with that um, I, I do understand the recruitment issues um, and again, pleased that the links have been made with other services throughout the council, so things like the adult learning yeah. services, um, and a, an opportunity, I think, to link up with the um, the employment hubs and things like that, which I, I know you'll be doing. Um, th so the host family scheme, I think, is a really interesting development, um, and I am quite excited about that. I think my question around that would be, um, around the training and support that would be given to the host families. Um, can, could you expand on that a little bit for us, please? Uh, I, I, can, I can provide a small bit of information. Sharon would have been able to provide a lot more. Um, the, the, re the recruitment and training um, um, is being supported by our, I think it's our um, uh, training department, our children's workforce training, um, and it'll be very similar to some of the training, although not as extensive as as 
with the foster carer um, because we have that as a template. We know that that works, um, but this obviously isn't some. Um, this isn't as intensive as as being foster care foster carer. But we know what the ingredients are, so that will be the basis of the training. The families will be supported by our inter internal residential staff, um, and we have made. Um, I know Sharon has made. Um, allowances in terms of structure and infrastructure to support that process as that as that grows um, very early days yet um, um, but that that's again is 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 it is you're right is exciting I think so and again um, being creative and innovative and looking at different ways that we can help support our young people so yeah I'll, I'll keep my eye on that one and yes. perhaps in the future we can bring that back and and see how the scheme's been running um, thank you, Sue Ann. Happy to open up to the floor for questions to um, Sue Ann. Thank you, Sue Ann. You've done a good job stepping in. Um, and uh, uh, I, I really like this um, thing we've got going where we've got the transition properties in the, and the cluster properties. I think that's really good because this whole thing of transition is absolutely key, isn't it, to how people fare when they they take on uh, independence and I'm sure they're, they're all dying for independence and, and take it maybe when they're not ready but we have to make sure that we're kind of safeguarding them against that by preparing um, and uh, it's good that we've got in, more involvement of uh, older looked after children in the uh, in the uh, forum where they can talk and discuss because that issue could be looked at and we can yeah. maybe get some information about what they think could be done better um, you know, because I mean, they're, they're the ones who have experienced it, and they'll know looking back and say, "I wasn't." They might not put it in these terms, but I wasn't prepared as well as I could have been right, yeah. for transition. Yeah. And they could talk about how it might be improved. Uh, and think, of course, I think, Councillor, councillor that the 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 developments of that transition has directly come from feedback of care leavers who have who have said. Um, this would have been beneficial for us to have had more support around. So that's exactly what we've done. Yes. Fabulous. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it's a wider issue, isn't it? This whole thing of transition is so important that the, that, that transition, that they're prepared for that transition with all the kind of skills that they need, you know, mm. basic skills like being able to cook. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, they, 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 they end mm. up dying to be independent and then they can't find that they can't or they're not confident in cooking stuff and stuff, mm. Sim very simple things yeah, like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's just how do we drive up the quality right across the spectrum of all these children in different settings or young people in different settings who are going to make that step into being independent mm. with support, but, you know, it's just how do we drive it up right across the board so whatever setting they're in. Yeah. We know that there's a, a kind of program which will, if they engage in it, and obviously you can't force that, but if they engage in it, they, they, they will actually have developed skills that they will find in hindsight. They might not think at the time, but the, they'll develop skills which they feel have actually yeah. equipped them better and gave them more conf given them more, they're given them more confidence when they, when they take that step into independence with support. Yeah, I think in terms of um, driving that development up, councillor, the the smaller the um, environment um, and the greater, I suppose. Um, concentration of support around that young person. Um, so the transition properties again are single single bedded um, flats, um, which will enable. The, the workers and that young person to be able to develop in a, in a safe environment um, where you have and it seems um, you know quite I suppose remarkable now to think that the four and five bedded units um, the homes that we have got are now considered large it's it's much more difficult to be able to provide that um, individual um, attention to to developing individual skills so we're absolutely certain that doing more more of that individual work with that young person who hasn't got the distractions of other young people in the home will will reap benefits um, and it's actually replicating um, 
you know, more of a family home, smaller, smaller homes. Um, you know, with, with I appreciate it's, it still remains artificial with staff, but um, that that does replicate a more of an average an average home for that for that young person to be developing in. Thanks, Sue Anne. All the best with you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hazelgrave. Um, Steve, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, yes, please, Chair. I remember to switch on this time. Uh, it, it, it might seem a minor point, but, but I think it's important. In three of the five uh, Regulation 44 inspections or, or visits, sorry, um, recording of information has cropped up. Now, it may well be being dealt with, but I wonder whether that's endemic of, of other areas as well. And, and keeping information about children is vitally important to secure their safeguarding. Uh, and I just wondered if you could, not you personally, if I could be reassured that that, that, that action is actually bearing fruit uh, as listed in the paper. Um, the, well, the report indicates that the managers put in place um, actions to to address those those concerns raised by the independent visitor. Um, I've not had anything raised with me to say that that's not been effective, um, but I could get some further information for you to reassure that the, all those actions are closed off. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Suan. Any more questions for Suan on this? And uh, just to give Suan some assurances from myself and hopefully from my uh, fellow councillors, a number of who have done the training with us, um, that when we're allowed to, we, we look forward to, to going back out and, and visiting. Yeah. Um, I know I really enjoyed those visits and I know I'm there to do a job, but actually it was really good to go and, and visit our young people in their homes. Um, so, yeah, we will make sure that we get back on to that as and when we're safely allowed to do so. Just one more final point from me, Chair, that, um, as I said, Ofsted are still um, undertaking assurance visits. We've had the last one was actually only a couple of weeks ago. In fact, it was only last week um, and a very, very positive um, uh, clean bill of health um, provided by Ofsted. So in terms of their assurance visits, they, they undertake a virtual um, interview of the staff, the manager of children and young people, and on the basis of, of that will determine whether or not they do physically come into the home. Um, they have, they um, fed back that they were absolutely satisfied with everything that they saw, everything that they heard, particularly from the young people. And Ofsted do go round and with their virtual camera look in all the children's bedrooms, etc. So it's a very thorough, very thorough assurance visit um, and they are not coming out. So that is really, really positive for, for one of our homes. Thank you. That, that's good. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you for feeding that back to us, Suan. Um, just seeing Council Hansgrave, you're typing. Did you want to come in? Or are you happy to so comment? If it's, if it's the end of the meeting, uh, just wanted to say I hope everybody enjoys their pancakes tonight. I'm I'm currently got a, a mixture for blini, which is uh, Russian pancakes. They they have uh, yeast in them and it rises quite alarmingly at times. So I have to check on it. <laughs> So everybody have a nice pancake evening. <laughs> oh, thank you, Councillor Hazelgrove. Yeah, if there are no more questions then for Sue Ann, um, happy to see, are you happy to take the recommendation in the report? Great, fantastic, thank you. And as uh, Councillor Hazelgrove has alluded to, let me just check my agenda. I believe we are at the end. Um, of the meeting so I would, would like to say thank you so much for everybody for being involved and for um, constantly looking at and making sure that our our children are looked after um, effectively um, and I do appreciate um, your time today um, have a safe evening and until next time adios thank you folks bye, -bye. bye.